All right, guys. Hey, folks, it's Chili. Today, we just got some of the biggest news I've ever seen for Age of Empires 4. An absolutely massive expansion is coming our way, and they just released a teaser trailer. We're going to be going through it right now, doing some breakdown and analysis. I'm going to be stopping on each frame, practically, to try to talk through uh, my predictions for what's coming, as well as give you guys my reaction. So let's get started. In unreckoned number, they cross to the east to seize the all right so <laughs> already i gotta stop it uh we did get this frame as a preview uh image when the dlc first got announced a few weeks back uh it does look like the developers are adding this kind of illustrated campaign uh cutscene that kind of tells the story of someone who i think is probably saladin defending against the crusaders saladin famously was the leader of the ayubid sultanate a predecessor to the mamluk sultanate in egypt a successor to the fatimid sultanate fatimid caliphate i think it actually was but in game the abbasids technically also encompass the Mamluks, so I think they'll be represented as the Abbasids in the campaign. This is a big departure from what we see with the current campaign, which features this kind of History Channel documentary style. Me personally, I was never that into the documentary style. I feel like it was a little bit corny and cheesy. I think telling a narrative is going to be far more interesting, so I like that they're going in this direction. The Holy City of Jerusalem. I also really like, especially this frame before, where we see the, uh, the woman running away with her child in fear. This is a this is an interesting depiction of the Crusades coming in because we're, we're finally getting it from the Muslim uh, perspective. You know, living in America in the West, we oftentimes see the Crusades as almost like justified in a way because it's been parallelized with the Iraq invasion and the Afghanistan invasion. There's a lot of sense that East and West have always been at conflict with each other and that in some way the West's mission is just. But here we're clearly seeing that, you know, innocent civilians have their lives at risk and things maybe aren't so holy in the Holy Land. Of Jerusalem. We call Love that shot. The Franks. Franks. Now this is cool. Um, the armor styles that I'm seeing here is evocative of the Byzantines. A lot of people were wondering whether or not the Byzantines would also be featured in the campaign. Uh, historically, the Crusades were launched because, or, or at least the, the big Crusades that everyone knows about, was launched because the Byzantines were getting pushed back. They lost a lot of their possessions on the eastern half of the Mediterranean, and they were calling for help against the Saracen invaders. So it seems like this image kind of confirms that Byzantine-style units and armies will probably make a feature in the campaign uh, but the fact that the narrator refers to them as franks hints that we'll see other european nations all kind of combined into the crusader state faction these pages tell the story of great Okay, this is amazing. It looks like we're finally getting a horse archer unit for the Abbasids. In game, very few factions have horse archers. Well, technically, there's only one horse archer unit, and that's for the Rus. The Abbasids do have access to the camel archer, and there's other horse archer style variants, such as the Mongo Dai, that are available in game. But historically, a lot of the factions, especially the ones in the Near East, relied on horse archers for their armies. Famously, the Battle of Hattin, uh, Gide Lusignan, the, the ruler of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, led out an army to try to face Saladin, and Saladin met him in the Battle of Hattin. Saladin tactic was instead of facing the crusaders head on rely on the crusaders lack of knowledge of the terrain to basically kill them with the heat of the sun in the desert combined with the lack of access to fresh water all the while saladin's horse archers would run around their flanks and harass them the whole time uh, until finally the main army was able to come in and, and finish them off so it's really cool that we'll finally get this kind of unit for the abbasids i'm guessing that this unit will primarily make an appearance in the campaign although there has been announced new faction variants coming to the game four new faction variants and one of the factions that's getting a variant is the Abbasids. There's been quite a bit of speculation on what exactly those variants are going to be. My guess is that the Abbasids might get the Ayyubid or the Mamluk Sultanate represented as an alternative to them, and perhaps instead of having camel archers, because it would be redundant of the Abbasids both had camel archers and horse archers, they'll probably have uh, horse archers instead. Which also suggests that faction variants may have the same buildings perhaps, but completely different unique units. Leaders who fought for our land and our faith. All right, I love this flag that we're getting for the Byzantines. This symbol is known as the Chiro. During the Roman Empire, the Chiro was a symbol of Christianity. It spells out the, the CH of Christ's name as well as the R. Uh, the P represents the R, the X represents the CH. Famously, Constantine, the Roman Emperor who first legitimized Christianity, won a battle in the Civil War for his power during the, I think it was called the Battle of Melvian Bridge. He had a dream the night before. In that dream, the Christian God came down and helped him out, and he woke up with this premonition knowing that he needed to 
paint the symbol of the Chiro on all of his soldiers' shields in order to attain victory, and they did attain victory in the next day. And then ultimately, Constantine became emperor and severely uh, reduced the amount of oppression that the Christians were facing in the empire. Throughout the early part of the Byzantine Empire, the Chiro was emblazoned on Byzantine shields, although in the later part, the insignia would change quite a bit. It's still really cool for us to see uh, this symbol, and I think it's a fitting symbol for the Byzantines. Okay, that's beautiful. So here we see what I'm guessing is a Imperial Age Byzantine base. Uh, we can clearly see the aqueduct running along the wall here. Uh, I really love seeing it uh, run along those hillsides. That looks beautiful. One of the things I really struggled with when I was designing the concept of the civilization was how aqueducts would work going up and down hills. I thought a lot about like what, how would it look? How do you justify it? Ultimately, historically, the aqueducts were covered. They had a little rooftop on, on, on the top, so you don't even see the water flowing. So this makes a ton of sense. I, I'm a little bit curious about what happens when you break a section of the, of the aqueduct. Do you see water flow down? That would be kind of a cool little detail. Also another detail, another little bit of aqueduct nerding here is uh, I, I did read a lot about the aqueducts to do the concept, is that the Greeks invented ways for water to flow upwards. Not only did they have the Archimedes screw, which is a, a screw that you could turn to, to lift water upwards, uh, but they also just used siphons uh, they, where they relied on pressure and gravity to kind of propel water upwards. We also get another look at the cistern here. You can clearly see that it's placed at the ends of the aqueduct, but a Another interesting thing here is this cistern right here. This one clearly looks a little bit bigger than this one. It has two fountain places. This could be a landmark, perhaps the cistern of Aetius, uh, which was one of the largest, most imposing cisterns in uh, Constantinople. In Istanbul today, if you try to go visit the cistern of Aetius, you actually see a soccer field in its location. Let's speculate a little bit more. A lot of people were saying that the mills and farms were going to be somehow tied to the cisterns. Maybe the cisterns have an aura that improves the farming rate. The previous image that we got showed that the farms were located very close to the cisterns. These farms look pretty far away from the cistern, but if this is a landmark cistern, perhaps its aura is much bigger. The announcement included a blurb describing how the Byzantines would have access to a new resource. So if I had to guess, the Byzantines resource might be something like water, and maybe cisterns have to be placed far enough away from each other to justify the building of the aqueduct. But perhaps they collect water, and then the more water you have, the more farms you'll, you'll be able to sustain. It could be that these special crops here, be they olives or a vineyard might be particularly reliant on water in order to grow. Oh, what do we have here? This is beautiful. Okay, my guess is that this is the representation of the Hippodrome. This definitely looks like a landmark. The Hippodrome, however, was a huge oval in shape. If you look at it in any map of the city, it's absolutely massive. Today, it got replaced by Sultimet Square uh, in Istanbul, so it's no longer standing today. I always wondered how they would represent the Hippodrome in game. Perhaps it's so big that it could be wonder-sized, but it clearly looks like the Hagia Sophia is going to be the wonder here. Uh, this could be a miniaturized representation of the Hippodrome. It looks like they kind of cut it off at the halfway point. Uh, I'd be okay with that personally, just to say like, hey, this is like a mini Hippodrome and it's going to serve as a landmark. The real size Hippodrome would probably need to take twice as much space and we've never had a rectangular shaped building in, in the game yet. Aside from that, we see the blacksmith here. I think we also see it right over here. We also see the university up front. This is an interesting building right here. I'm not sure what this is. This could be the Byzantine monastery. It looks like the shape here looks very similar to the monastery for other civilizations. This is clearly the market, uh, stable, siege workshop, barracks, archer range. This is also a bit of a weird building right here. I don't know what this is. Actually, you know what this is? There was also the announcement that mercenaries were coming in with this faction. You could purchase mercenaries. This looks like a mercenary camp. In my concept for the Byzantines, I suggested that they would have a landmark called the Varangian Quarters. This could be like a mercenary quarter type of building. It looks like you have some tents here. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. This is almost like, a, like an embassy or something like that that you can hire foreign troops from. In the, in the previous preview, we saw um, Abbasid Ghulams as well as Mongol Keshiks riding through the Byzantine base. I still stand by the fact that Ghulams and Keshiks are weird mercenary units to be used by the Byzantines. They definitely did not historically use Ghulams and Keshiks. They used more like Arbitraires, Genoese mercenaries, famously the Catalan Company, a contingent of Almugavars, which are light mercenary infantry from Spain, as well as horse archers from Kumans, Kipchaks, Bulgarians. I I'm really curious what kind of mercenaries we'll be able to get here. Here. It could just be every civilization has units that are available here, or maybe other civilizations on depending on the map or something like that. I'm excited to see what we'll get here. It, it'll be an interesting balance challenge because you can't give them just everything. It'll, kind of, it'll cover too many of their weaknesses. Up next here we have, oh, this is really cool. The, the Byzantine spearmen here clearly have shields. So a lot of you guys have been telling me the Byzantine spearmen have shields. I'm sorry, I was a doubter. I didn't want to believe it because in, in this game, shields signify that you have some kind of armor, especially ranged armor. And spearmen are defined by 
by their weakness to ranged units. There's a lot of spearmen already in the game that historically should have shields, but they chose not to represent them with shields. I didn't want to believe that these guys had shields. The only other spearmen in the game that have shields is the Donsos for the Malians, and the Donsos have plus one melee armor, uh, which I think is what the shield is meant to signify. It could be that these are unique units, maybe the Manalians, these unique Byzantine pikemen, but it doesn't look like the spear itself. It looks like all that much like a pike or a Manalian. So my guess is that these are typical spearmen with some kind of technology that gives them maybe teardrop or oval shaped shields. I do wonder how they will balance and compensate for the added armor that the spearmen will have. Oh, and the last thing I want to highlight here is these cool looking towers on the right. A lot of people, when they saw the architecture used for the Ottomans in game, they were worried that it would overlap too much with potential Byzantine architecture. It looks like these towers look very similar to the Ottoman towers, but you can still tell that they have their own unique identity going on. All right, let's move on. Okay, we gotta stop it here again. There's just so much happening. All right, again, we see what looks to be like an early Byzantine base, probably in the feudal or even the dark age. These uh, these houses look particularly run down, made out of stone. This looks like an early town center. There's sheep gathering nearby. You, you see the little stand that you can put your statue on. This looks like an early Byzantine scout right here. And again, a lot of focus on these farms and this, this unique mills. I'm really guessing that the Byzantines will have farms that aren't just aesthetically different, but also mechanically play in a very different way. They probably need access to water in some way. Man, this is going to be such a cool civilization to play. Screw Japan, I'm probably going to be maining the Byzantines. Okay, but at the same time, not screw Japan. Uh, this symbol right here, really cool. It is the symbol of the emperor, a stylized image of the chrysanthemum flower. I think it's a great choice to represent the Japanese here. I also love that it's yellow on black, or golden black rather. Uh, historically, I think both the Oda clan and the Tokugawa clan had golden black as their clan insignia. So that's probably a reference to that. Okay, there's a lot going on in this image. Let's take a look at this. Once again, we have this blue tiling. So this kind of looks like an imperial age Japan base. I'm guessing that this pagoda looking structure is the wonder for Japan. It's quite large. This will be a pretty big departure from the uh, wonder just, used right. in like, AOE 2, which is the Todaiji, a massive like, Japanese temple, which I would have loved to have seen represented like in game. PM. I'm not sure which pagoda this is. To my knowledge, there's not exactly any monumental sized Japanese pagodas in history, but feel free to correct me. I love the way the samurai here are posed. They're clearly standing at attention with their swords at their sides, looking proper samurai-like. Looks like the spears got updated. They're no longer wielding knight lances. It does, however, look like they're wielding very standard billhook style spears, which is the same generic spear that every other faction in the game is using. So that's a little bit disappointing, but it could just be for readability's sake. Back here, these look like, this looks like an army of horse archers. Probably the Onamusha, which recently got teased. Uh, Japanese warrior women riding as horse archers. It looks like this unit can be serving as the crosswoman replacement. Up front here, we have the Japanese heavy lancers. I'm still personally not a big fan of Japan getting heavy cavalry. Historically, they did not have heavy cavalry. Japanese horses were too small, the terrain was too mountainous. Even the concept of light cavalry was just barely becoming a thing by the time of the Sengoku Jidai. I really wish they came up with some kind of alternative to heavy cavalry. Another thing that I'm not exactly a big fan of is the circular shields that we're seeing on the lancers, as well as the circular shields that we see on the horsemen over here. Traditionally, Japanese warriors, compared to the warriors of other societies, weren't really depicted as much with shields, but when they did have shields, their shields were typically square-shaped, not this circular round shape here. I I'm wondering where they got that idea. I do however like the uh, this like dragon crest design on the horse's head. Someone posted a model of what these are probably inspired by. Okay. So this was something that I had been arguing against for quite a while. We did see in the teaser image that what looks to be a blacksmith was oftentimes placed next to a mine. And a lot of people were speculating that the blacksmith and the mine would be some kind of combined structure. I really felt like that wasn't going to be the case, but it does look like that is going to be the case here. The Japanese will have some kind of unique mining building. This could be a forge or a blacksmith as well. I'm not sure, but clearly you can see villagers dropping off resources there. Historically, Japan was not abundant in natural resources, especially high quality ores. So to compensate for this, they needed to work on their technique. This is where you get the myth of the thousand folded katana blade. The idea was that the added effort in the production of the iron would help compensate for the low quality of the original raw materials and reduce the impurities of the ore. It does seem like that's going to be factoring into the design for the Japanese here. 
All right, so variant civilizations. I'm really excited about this. This has been something that I've been advocating for for a while now. In fact, some of you might remember seeing my post on the subreddit where I recommended different kinds of faction variants. The idea here is that the way they design the game, it is way too much effort to create a new faction. New factions have completely new voice lines for every single unit that also evolve as you age up. They have unique unit models for every single unit, even ones that are not unique units. They have unique ships, unique architecture, unique art, unique music. There's way too much production value going into these factions. I mean, I love it. Don't get me wrong. As a fan, I'm eating it up. But when I'm imagining this as a developer, it's just way too much effort to create new civilizations. It's just not sustainable. So if we want to get more civilizations represented in game, and there's been a lot of clamoring for new civilizations, I've been one of the loudest guys trying to ask for new civilizations. Variant civilizations is the best way we're going to do that. My guess is that variant civilizations will have to represent polities that are no longer standing today so that there's not some kind of political backlash. I suggested the idea that Korea could perhaps be represented as a variant to China, considering that they both have the imperial officials and the nest of bees, and a lot of people lash back. I think for major countries like today, especially like Korea, they will appear as their own faction sometime down the line. In fact, I created a concept for the Koreans in response to the backlash that I received, because I do think that there is a lot of unique history there worth exploring. But for splinter civilizations that appeared in history and don't exist today, I see a lot of potential for this. So I'll probably do another video where I break down potential faction variants, so I won't get too much more into it right now. But the addition of 10 new maps is absolutely massive. Two new biomes, also massive. I, I, don't, I don't particularly care too much about biomes, but I'm really hoping to see some snow, probably some sand, considering the setting of this expansion. I also have a lot of opinions on how new maps should be designed in this game. I'm going to be creating a new video for that as well. But the TLDR is that I'm really hoping that these maps will factor in team-based gameplay. A lot of the current maps work really well on 1v1, but when you scale it up to the size of 4v4, it just doesn't work as well. All right, here's that Japanese unique unit that we've seen before. I'm thinking that these guys might be called the Hatamotos or something like that. Hatamotos were traditionally the bannermen, the the flag bearers, the, the elite soldiers that were closest to the daimyo or the shogun. They're the only unit that we've seen for this faction that carry this Sashimono, the banner. You can see that the archers have this kind of bullseye insignia, the katana infantry have this sword insignia, and the cavalry here have this kind of like, it looks like a diamond formation insignia. I'm still biased in thinking that this is a single unit that can transform into these different modes. It just doesn't make sense to me that Japan, on top of everything else that they already have, would have an additional cavalry unit, an additional archer, and an additional heavy infantryman. We also see that these guys all have the glowing gold aura around them. So in game, that usually signals some kind of buff that they're receiving. If I had to guess, these guys are getting a buff from standing close to one another. So that could be representative of their bannerman status. And the last thing I'll note here is that for some reason, the, the katana infantry here all have this kind of like black top to their design. I'm really not sure what that is. That seems like weirdly unique for them. Aside from that, these guys look absolutely badass. I'm really happy with this design, especially for this cavalry. Uh, this looks more like what a samurai cavalryman should look like, not the heavy lancers that we see. Okay, here we see a mix of a few units. It looks like Japan has a traction trebuchet. This looks like the traction trebuchet that the Mongols have. So it, it kind of makes sense. Uh, traditionally, Japan did not really use trebuchets, but I am surprised to see a traction trebuchet here, considering that that is a, currently a Mongol unique unit. Uh, in this cavalry mass here, we see uh, the Onamusha horse archers, we see the lancers, the horsemen, and in the back, we see a mix of spearmen and other kinds of infantry. Here we see another image of the traction trebuchet, as well as some bombards. So it looks like Japan will have access to bombards as well as Maginot. That sounds pretty standard. No surprises there. The Byzantines have archers posted on the walls. They have this kind of cool looking cape on the on the tops of their backs. Oh, and I just love the aqueducts. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just nerding so much about the aqueducts. I'm such a big fan of this. With regards to ships, I don't really know anything about the naval warfare in this game. I go out of my way to avoid it in all my concepts, and I don't really play it that often when I play it in-game. Historically, Japan built up their navy to go invade Korea during the Imjin War. Uh, we might be seeing some Atakebunes. AoE 3 gave Japan a lot of unique-looking naval units, so it would be cool to see those guys represented in the game. Okay, here we're getting a bird's-eye view of a battle between the Lancers for the Japanese, with the men-at-arms for heavy infantry for the Byzantines. People have been saying that these guys are the Varangian Guard. Possibly, I still lean towards the idea that the Varangian Guard should be using bearded axes just because that seems so much more badass, but we haven't seen any units like that yet, and it's not outside of the realm of possibility that these guys could be the Varangian Guard. It's not like they would never use swords and shields. Okay. 
This is, there's just so much happening here. Oh my God. Okay, so let's let's take a look at this one. Immediately I see the cataphracts. These guys very clearly look like the Byzantine cataphracts in the Imperial Age. Elite cataphracts with this gold plating and the, oh my God, it looks so good. I'm so excited for this faction. Here we have the flamethrowers. The flamethrowers that we've all predicted would be coming. I was thinking that it would be the Cairo Siphon, a handheld flamethrower that would replace the hand cannoneers for the Byzantines. Instead, it looks like we are getting a flamethrower thrower ram this looks like it's something that will replace a ram it'll deal a lot of siege damage probably continuous siege damage maybe it will deal more damage the longer it attacks in spite of what looks like metal plating on the backs i'm guessing it's still susceptible to villager torch attacks the same way rams are also i'm guessing that we're going to be getting this unit relatively early on maybe even as soon as the feudal age just because historically the Byzantines did have access to Greek fire flamethrowers as early as 674 CE, which is at the earlier end of the time frame within this game. It does look like while the Japanese buildings here, they have the Imperial Age tiling, that this structure still looks like it's in the Feudal Age, and it looks like this is the structure that we saw the Shinobi standing in front of in the teaser image. Maybe this is like a Shinobi village or something like that. My guess is that this is probably a landmark, maybe the second H2 feudal landmark for the Japanese. The first one is the granary, the second one is this kind of shinobi related training center all right here we have the charging samurai it does look to me like the samurai infantry back here are wielding particularly long swords i almost thought these were naganadas originally i was speculating originally that the that we see samurai in the feudal age for japan wielding the naganada my guess is that they'll have a technology that gives them some kind of sword in the later ages it could be that instead of getting a katana they actually get the nodachi which is a much larger sword specifically designed for killing cavalry my sense is that samurai are going to be a men-at-arms replacement with the naganada and then the nodachi that has some kind of bonus against cavalry because those swords look absolutely massive all right and that's that's it that's the sultan's ascend well, what do you guys think? I'm really excited. I This is way more than I ever imagined. Four faction variants on top of everything else is crazy. There's just so much content coming here. I think it's a good day to be an Age of Empires fan. I am a little bit sad that the release date is, I think November 14th is what they announced. I was personally hoping for something in October. So it looks like we'll have to wait a little bit longer, but all around very exciting news. So what, what do you guys think? Was there anything that I missed? Let me know in the comments below and if you like what you saw here, please leave a like and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. Until next time.